Uh, Mary and I were in a uh, large Roman Catholic cathedral in Cincinnati, Ohio. And think of it, uh, <laughs> very informal people like Mary and me being invited into large Catholic cathedrals to preach. It's very difficult for me to grasp that fact, but God is doing it. He's doing funny, funny things like recently we got to go to Korea and speak about praising God to a pretty good-sized congregation of 500,000 people. Now that's a lot of folks gathered into one congregation in a big square in the center of Seoul, Korea. But God loves to do things like that. And I was sitting up there in the platform looking out, and, and my heart was hard, I could hardly keep my heart beating because I saw all these people out there. And the Spirit of the Lord whispered to me and said, Merlin, do you remember back at those football games? What? What football games? You remember I used to sit in those football games and there would be 50,000 people out there and you would say, oh God, please have them come up there and invite me to speak to all these people. Lord, ask, ask them to, somebody to come here and take me up and let me talk to all these people about the good news of the gospel. And you know, they never did. <laughs> never once in all the, none of those games, they never invited me up. But God said, you know, when I told you you'd listen to me, when I'd do, he said, there are more than 50,000 people out there, son. I just multiplied it by 10. <laughs> just 500 thousand people out there. And I said, oh Lord, I'm so glad I listened to you. You know what you're doing, God. I believe what you're doing. Well, anyhow, I was sitting up here on the platform of this Catholic cathedral about, uh, I think there was probably around 2,000 people there. And it, suddenly, the funny thought came to my mind. How in the world did I get here? And sometimes I'm traveling all over the world and I, I, I go back and my secretary says, Merlin, I have, I've made the arrangements. You're going here. Like when we get back from, new, from here, from England, uh, we'll have a few days to straighten up and then we'll leave for two weeks in Japan. But anyhow, I can't keep track of where I am. And I sat there on the platform. Lord, this is really funny. Here I am, a Methodist pastor about to speak to all these Catholics. Lord, this is really, really something. I don't know how I got here. And I was trying to think. That I, I didn't know the, the priest there, and I didn't remember the invitation. And I just sat there being troubled for, for a little while. And then, the, then I thought, well, I've got to get my mind off of that. I've got to figure out what I'm going to talk about tonight. And the Lord hadn't revealed anything to my, to my mind or to my spirit. And he likes to do that to me, to see whether I can jump up and feel excited and happy and don't know what I'm going to talk about. And sometimes I'm tempted to be real, <laughs> real upset. But anyhow, I began to think, Lord, okay now, Lord, we've fooled around here. What am I supposed to talk about tonight? And the Spirit of the Lord said, I want you to talk about lukewarm Christians. No, no Lord, I misheard you. I, I cannot talk about lukewarm Christians tonight. These, my Catholic brothers and sisters, would misunderstand. They would think that I thought we Protestants were spirit-filled and they were lukewarm. So, Lord, we must have another subject for tonight. But the Spirit said, nothing else. You are just going to talk about lukewarm Christians. That's it for tonight. So, with fear and trepidation, I made it up to the pulpit when I was called on and I began to talk about lukewarm Christians. And as these words are coming out of my mouth, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of retreating and planning my escape as to how, how I can get up, out of there. And on the, this side, there were a whole row of Roman Catholic priests, and this side, there were two rows of, of Catholic nuns. And I thought, I know these people are going to misunderstand, but all right. So I just unloaded and told all that I knew about lukewarm Christians. And when I was through, I didn't know what to do then, but I finally thought, well, all I can do is ask if there are any lukewarm Christians here that I can pray for. And if there happens to be one here, I'll be happy to pray for you. And God, with the power of His Spirit, will deliver you. Well, the whole row of priests stood up. 
And then the two rows of nuns stood up. (laughs) And then nearly 2,000 Roman Catholics stood up. And we concluded that service with joy and gladness and praise. But when I was through, (laughs) the head priest came up to me, and without a smile or anything, he said, Mr. Carruthers, would you come, you and your wife come to my office with me? And I said, oh, now I'm going to get it. So we went over to his office, it was over in this area, and he said, the first words out of his mouth was, would you like to know why you're here? Oh, how did he know that's what I was thinking about? Well, and then he explained to us. He said, ten years ago, uh, one of the people in the church gave me a book called Prison to Praise. And... I put it on my bookshelf and I left it there. And it was there for 10 years. And one day I was getting ready to go on a retreat. And I saw that book and I thought, where in the world did that come from? So I couldn't find anything looked half decent to take. So I I just took that with me. And when I got to the retreat, I read it. And he said when I was through with it, I took it, and there was another priest in the other side of the room, and I threw it on the floor. And I said, what a bunch of garbage that is. And I said, oh, now. <laughs> uh, now he's going he's gonna to tell me what all I said that was wrong. But he said, uh, he said, after a while, I got thinking about it. And it kept coming into my mind, maybe, maybe he's not all crazy. Maybe God does want us to praise him for everything. And he said, it kept troubling me. And I said, well, okay, I'll go back and read it again. If you've read Prison to Praise once and you don't understand it, people have told me they had to read it ten times before it made any sense to them. So he said, I went back to the room and I went through it again. When I was through the second time, I thought, well, he he quotes the Bible it seems to make sense, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll try it. And he said, I couldn't think of anything to try it on. And he kept thinking, no, I don't want to do this. That's too important. I better not mess with that or this or something else. And finally, he, he, he couldn't think of anything until his, his favorite stole came to his mind. It was a beautiful stole that he, one of his parishioners had made and they had embroidered, embroidered his initials on the, the front of it in gold. And he said every time he put that stole on, he felt so special. He felt that person loves me. And he just put that on with joy, and he wore it and enjoyed wearing it. But one Sunday, he came for Mass, and he couldn't find the stole. And he looked everywhere, sort of like in panic. Where's the stole? And it couldn't find it. On Monday morning, he called all the other priests and the nuns. He called them into his office and he said, now something has happened to my stole and I want to know where it's at. Now everything is canceled until you find that stole. That's nice about being the top of anything. You can just say, do it. So they all took off to find it. After a couple of hours, one of them came back. They must have drawn straws. But one of them came back and said, I, we're sorry. We have looked everywhere. Your stole is nowhere in the cathedral. We have decided that someone has stolen it. Your stole is stolen. Well, the priest told us that from that moment on, he began to grumble. And when he stood up to speak, he looked around the congregation. One of you out there, (laughs) one of you, which one of you was it? You stole my stole. He said, for a whole year, that was in my mind. And I thought on that retreat, "That's that's what I'll do. I'll thank God for somebody stealing that. And he started, thank you, God, for somebody stole it. And then he said, but God, 
you know I don't mean it. <laughs> I'm asking you tonight to thank God even when you can't mean it. Why? Because it's God's word. Give thanks always for all things. You don't understand it? I don't think God could care less whether you understood it or not. He just says, do it. I decided he's got the right to tell me that. You say, Merlin, you, do, you shouldn't take just one verse of Scripture. Well, once you go wade through all of my books I, I, and study them, you'll find that there are hundreds and hundreds of Scripture that say exactly the same thing. Thank God. Believe God. Trust God for everything. And don't grumble and don't complain and don't get upset and don't worry about anything. 